something like. What's he doing here? He was a man of witchcraft. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, he wasn't supporting it. No. He okay, was. Good. Right. I want to clarify that. Yeah. 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 Um, and Diane, you want to? And I'm Diane. And I'm Diane. <laughs> Um, pretty much been the same we're place. trying to figure out who who isn't here. We got three people joining us from Ohio um, that just kind of came on board, and then who else are we missing? That Bob and Kathy, Mary, Camerata, and Mary, and Mary, um, and that it. Bob and Kathy, and and there's only eighteen of them. Yeah. There's Kathy, no, no, I found a bill. Oh, yeah. So you have to find the four join the four really joining us tonight. No, uh, no the one that 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's only so 19. There's 19, oh, 19 so um, yeah. I think that's yeah. the majority of our group, so we'll get to know each other well. Um, uh, I just put this together. This is primarily taken off the uh, registration sheet, uh, but I thought we'd add the kind of our departure times and our airline time stuff here. It's not all um <clears throat> still, yeah. Is this what came in the mail? This is the this is the one that came to the email this morning. Oh, okay. Yeah. Text, yeah. yeah. This is just the paper version of it. Good. Um, Good. What I try to do is, is kind of give you the highlights of the day and then the physical locations where it would be, like the cities and towns, and then kind of narrative um, and where I could find where we had the hotels where we were staying um, so you could see where the hotels we were staying so you can kind of get a sense of where they are. I couldn't get it all on one sheet or we couldn't read it. Um, I also sent you the PDF, or Barb sent the PDF so you can have it on your phones or but just something you can have. Um, but as you look through there, you can kind of get a sense of um, our travel times. We're going to be, <clears throat> a lot of times, we're not sh shifting hotels every night, which is um, many of the trips that we take when we go, uh, you're in a different hotel every night, and you're packing up, and you're going, and you're packing up, and you're going. Um, and it's good because you get to see a lot, but it's also a lot of packing and unpacking. Um, so this is nice. I think we're like four or five nights in one hotel, which is good. And, and then we kind of use that. But Israel as a nation isn't physically that large that you can kind of uh, bust out of, so that's nice. Um, we did get, you know, I think everyone got the information from Barb, and I tried to put this in here on our um, extended time in Jordan. That wasn't a part of the original trip, and that was the other part I wanted to put on here. If you look on Sunday, March uh, 19th, the stuff that came through the registration, um, this is different, um, and so... <coughs> They changed our Jordan times because they added a day for us, which is good. Um, and so we're going to get to see some things. I don't know if I remember if it was on there, the, um, the stuff we're doing at Wadi Rum. I don't know if that yeah, was, that was, that was this is new. Um, so uh, we're going to do a Jeep ride into the Wadi. Um, oh, cool. and, and it just it simply says stay in the Wadi, but I'm not sure what hotel they're in, so I just kind of right. left it open. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of, of what we're doing. It sounds like we're going to have a lot of um, time to get to see Amman, Jordan. So that's where we are. I tried to put some flight times, at least the estimated flight times, um, and then the departure, or arrival back here that last time. That's just an estimate because who knows you know, what time we'll get done finding, collect everything, and stop and get back here. So it'll be probably closer to midnight um, before we get back on the 23rd. That's a long time. Yeah. Um, but the. the so that's. For your perusal, any um, other stuff? I'm a little yeah. concerned that we're not going to get the whole hair. I mean, we didn't really give us a whole lot of time. Maybe we'll be on the road before 10. Yeah, um, we can certainly leave as soon as we pack up. We don't have to leave at 10, but it, I thought we could leave any early. Amy has to work an hour in the morning. Oh, okay. So um, if sure. we meet here at 930, um, we load up. Um, it's five hours to O'Hare. We don't leave till 7. Um, so if we get leave here by 9.30, and that gives us an hour to stop somewhere plus, and then we still get the three hours early. Okay. That's kind of what I thought, but okay. well, you know, three hours for international flights is usually kind of the standard, but I mean, if we... Well, it's just getting through security. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. Yep. Okay, that's kind of where we left off. Um, we're also just hitting some highlights in terms of our places to see. I think last time we talked just about Jerusalem, we kind of made our way um, from up in the north part of Israel. We're now kind of into Jerusalem. Um, uh, and I think last time we talked about the, uh, the old city where we're at. Um, one of the places we're going to go to is the Dome of the Rock, which is um, a historic site primarily for the Muslims right now. They own it and they control it. Um, this is supposedly where Abraham sacrificed, depends on who you believe, Ish, either Ishmael or Isaac. 
because the Muslims believe that Abraham sacrificed Ishmael, the, Christ, the Jews believe, and the Christians believe he sacrificed Isaac, and that's that's how far back this tension between the Jews and the, and the uh, Muslims goes. Um, it is on the way of the uh, on the way of the Via Del Rosso, the way of sorrows, which is uh, one of the roads. And I think um, if you look at our, our destinations, we will spend some time walking that road of the 14 points of the cross, where you can see this historically probably isn't the exact path that Jesus walked from his uh, arrest to his crucifixion, but it gives you a, a sense uh, of the, the journey he took, and it's one that they've been using um, to represent that for probably the last 1,700 years. Um, it represents the way of the cross. Um, we will stop at the Church of the Sepulchre um, and hopefully get plenty of time there. Uh, this is a huge complex. It's not just a church. Uh, lots of little side churches, lots of little side chapels, um, and this is supposedly the the actual site of the crucifixion, it's the site of the, the grave where he was supposedly buried for three days. Um, and there is a... Um, huh? Well, the, the historically, there have been worshiping at this site since like the second century. So we're not talking something they just guessed like last year. Um, no, 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 I meant supposedly buried. Supposedly buried. Yeah. Well, he... I don't yeah. think that, yeah. Yeah. He, where he was buried, supposedly, uh, but he rose from the grave. So anyhow, the church of Sepulchre, if you go and look at that, um, it is a huge, huge complex, and you'll want to spend some time in there um, seeing the different sites. You've been there, right? Yes. Um, one of the things that I think I saw once, um, and maybe you can give us some enlightenment, is there is a tradition that you can take a cross and you can touch it to the to the rock in which he was crucified, and that's kind of a tradition. Mm -hmm. So um, it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't make it special, it doesn't make it holy. But if you have, you know, maybe you want to take a cross for your grandchildren, um, and you can just say, this is the cross that touched the rock in which Jesus was crucified, and then you can bring it home to him. It's kind of a nice tradition that you can have and, you know, and, and give to you, or you want one for yourself. Uh, I plan on doing that. Um, so if you've got one that's maybe a favorite that hangs on your wall and you want to take it with you, this is the place to take it and to bring it into this Church of the Sepulchre. And um, it doesn't mean anything, but you will see a lot of people carrying around or you could probably buy one there, I imagine you can, but if it's one that you brought from home, it might be more value. But um, that's uh, one of the places we're going to see there. Um, obviously, references to Jerusalem are all of the scriptures, and so this is not a complete list. Um, one of the first earliest references in the Bible is the, um, the reference to Melchizedek, and we all remember Melchizedek. He's one of his favorite characters in the Old Testament um, because he was the king of Salem. And he was first appears in Genesis where he appears to Abraham. Um, and Abraham uh, offers him a tenth of all of his goods. Abraham worships him. Um, and he's listed as the king of Salem. Um, and then he kind of disappears from the scriptures. And he shows up again uh, later on in uh, Hebrews. And he talks about, um, in Hebrews it's, it references Melchizedek. Um, and there in Hebrews it talks about Melchizedek, who was without father or mother, without beginning or end the king of Salem, a one who receives our worship. And so this character, Melchizedek, is, is a kind of a mystical character in, in Scripture. Um, depends on which theologians you listen to, but um, I follow the, the tradition that Melchizedek was probably the pre-incarnate Christ. This was the second person of the Trinity um, that showed himself to Abraham at that time. Um, you know, the king of Salem, and, and why would he receive one-tenth, which is a tithe, the offering, why would he receive the... the uh, worship of, of Abraham at that time. Um, he has no beginning, he had no mother or father, which is what we see in... So his first reference um, of Jerusalem was there in, in uh, Genesis. Um, Joshua, who defeats the five kings as he's conquering the kingdom, um, is in Jerusalem, um, named the city of David. Um, David brings the ark outside of Jerusalem, and this is where you see the old city, or, or the city of David, which is not physically Jerusalem, uh, so when you go to the old city, where we're going to see, it had the five, the four quarters where the temple is. You've got the old city, but then you go to another area. It's called the city of David, which is uh, probably where David uh, had his headquarters. So it's it's shifted uh, physically. So you, when you you can easily get confused because there's Jerusalem and there's city of David. They're kind of side by side. So you kind of kind of put that in your mind as as two physical locations. Um, but that's where um, David set up and probably established the original city of Jerusalem. Um, there wasn't until just recently there was, was a discussion that the city of David, 
King David's establishment of Jerusalem as king was probably more mythical than real reality. But in 2014, there were some archaeological digs that discovered that there was a highly sophisticated society under the um, geography that's just outside of the city walls of, of what we now call Jerusalem. So it's very likely that this is where David established Jerusalem before the temple was built years later. So, you know, history is proving that uh, the Bible is more true than, than uh, modern people want to believe. Um, where Solomon built the temple, um, the Jerusalem was attacked by the king of Egypt, all these different references. Um, we know in, in 586, the temple was destroyed uh, by the Assyrians, and so this is the first temple that was destroyed, the one that Solomon built. Um, that was one of those big things in Jerusalem. Um, the second temple was, was rebuilt in, in 532, began in 532 and, and continued on, and became Herod, later built the, the temple um, courtyard, the temple mount, which we will see kind of parts of that when we get there. Um, the second temple, and, and they will talk about, you'll hear the second temple era. That's a language that you'll hear a lot of. Um, second temple era was that, that temple that was built after the, the Jews returned from exile. Um, five, or 721, 722, the northern kingdom of Jerusalem was taken, or northern kingdom of Israel was taken into captivity, um, and that kingdom disappeared. 586, the southern kingdom, you know, going back even further, David established all of Israel. Solomon split Israel into two nations, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. 722, the northern kingdom was taken into captivity and disappeared from history. 586, the southern kingdom, which included <coughs> Jerusalem, was captive, taken captive, and the first temple that Solomon built was destroyed. Seventy years later, under Nebuchadnezzar, um, Assyria allowed the Jews to return, and they rebuilt the temple, and that would be under Nehemiah and Ezra, those books from the Bible. That was the re that's the second temple. So when they talk about second temple, they're talking about the temple that was built after the exile that came back in. So that's kind of the, what we will see, um, is that second temple, Jerusalem. So it's 586 B.C. and, and built around 530s, 520s, um, that built. And then the addition of that was under... Herod the Great, and Herod built in was it four to ten to four BC uh, when he added the Temple Mount and the courtyard and all the things that you see around it today. So that's kind of the history of the temples. Um, but the Second Temple period is what what you'll hear a lot of. That temple uh, that um, was built in 530s that one was ultimately destroyed in 70 AD um, when Jerusalem was finally destroyed and has never been rebuilt. So there's really just the two temples. You may hear the, sometimes they talk about uh, the third temple Jerusalem or the third temple Israel. That is what Zionistic Christians and Zionistic Jews today are trying to build because if we can build the temple again, we can reestablish the sacrificial system and that will allow the Messiah to return. So there is a, a sense that we're trying to build that temple once more because it's been destroyed for 2,000 years and the Messiah can't come back until there's a place where he can come back to. Um, so... That's the language you'll hear when you talk about Second Temple period. That's the time period of that, that temple after uh, the return from the exile. So this is some language that you'll hear. Uh, I know it's all confusing, but um, it is a, a history lesson, and you will get college credit when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to pass, um, though, to get the credit. Pardon me? You have to pass to get the credit. Yeah. Well, it's a pass to class. Oh, good. <laughs> you, you, you come back alive. You passed. Okay. <laughs> But I know. We're grading on a scale. I'm not watching everybody else's faces. Okay. Okay. Here we got Lois with us. If we survive, yeah. Yeah. No, we're we're. Um, New Testament, obviously, we know the temple is where where Jesus was brought when he was a baby. Um, what was the famous thing that happened to the temple as Jesus is a baby? This wonderful uh, um, song of Simeon, the Nuc Dementis that we sing. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. You know, we, we sing that in our, in our worship service, that, that beautiful idea that, that the fulfillment of God's promise from Adam and Eve has now made, taken place um, at the temple. Uh, so we see that, obviously, at, uh, in, at age 12, we see Jesus there back at the temple and, and the colonnades teaching, and we will see parts of that when we get to the temple. Um, so some of those big things that happen at the temple mount um, that all take place. 
that temple, which, which we have in our minds, we kind of have a picture of in our eyes, doesn't exist anymore. That is the, the, the uh, Dome of the Rock. That is a Muslim mosque today. Uh, what we will see is one of the walls that, that used to be the support for the temple platform. So that area that, used, that we see as a temple is now a Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock. Um, and so that's kind of where we're going to, you know, we have this image that's going to be there, but it doesn't exist today. This, this is what, um, we will see the model city, um, and so you'll have a, a picture of what it looks like. The model city uh, was built, I think, in 1967 or 68. It's, a, it's about a quarter acre size. It's an exact replica, replica of what the temple would have looked like under um, King Herod, that second temple period. Um, it took seven years to build, um, and it was based upon the... the uh, historical writings, and you've heard me use the, the name Josephus or Flavius Josephus. Um, he just goes generally by Josephus. He was a contemporary of Jesus uh, at that time, but he was a Jewish historian. So he was a historian that lived at the same time of Jesus that uh, was like a historian, just took a record of what was going on and kept events. Was not a Christian, was not a believer, wrote about this person named Jesus that others thought was the Messiah. Um, that others claim rose from the dead. Um, and so he is one of the, the what we call a, um, a, 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 a hostile source, a non-biblical source that speaks of the resurrection. You know, if you're, if you're an attorney, what you love to have is a hostile source that proves your case. Um, you like that. <laughs> you know, you're not saying this for your personal motives. Josephus is a hostile source to the, to the resurrection because he talks about it because other people talk about it. So... Why would he do that if, unless there was something that happened there? Um, so this model is based on his writings of, of what it, the, the town and the city looked like. And we'll stop there and we'll get to see that. So uh, that's kind of an interesting thing that we see. And you can see the size of it. Um, what I had been told and, and what I believe to be true um, is this courtyard that you see. This is the, the actual building in the middle there. You can't see. But the building in the middle there is what the actual temple is. Um, so you kind of see that tall structure that sits up. That's where, when you think of the, uh, used to be the, um, uh, the tabernacle, that tent where the, the, the Lord dwelled, um, that Solomon built this temple. That tall structure is where the temple curtain was. Now the curtain that hung in there, just so you get a sense of size, was 120 feet tall and 70 feet wide. So this building is at least that tall that it had to house that curtain. Um, that curtain was the, the difference between the Holy of Holies. Behind that curtain is where um, the living quarters of God was, if you expect, if you expect it. Um, on the other side of the curtain is where the, the priests could go, and that's where they would offer their sacrifices on a daily basis. That's where the, the showbread was. That's where a lot of the utensils were kept. Um, in this courtyard right here, this in front, um, this is the courtyard of the priests. This is where... They would gather and do their instructions, and they would only the Levites were allowed. Um, this section around here, this front of it, was where the, the, the rabbis would do their teaching. This is probably where Jesus was when he was 12 years old. Um, it was in this section where they, he's teaching the rabbis, and the men, they would come and, and do their instruction. This other section um, was the court of the Jews, and it was divided into the court of the Gentiles. If you were non-Jew, you could come certain ways into this courtyard, but you couldn't come any further. Um, they would have, uh, it would be roped off, literally on both sides, and uh, there was just a couple of passages past this rope, and they would literally have signs in both Greek and Hebrew that said, if you're a Gentile and come past this, you basically are threatened with death. Um, no Jew, no Gentile could come past this. Now, women could come past it, um, men could come past it, but if uh, any Gentile would, you, you'd die. On the other side, this is the colonnade, so you can kind of see all the columns, so that's where the colonnades were where this is where Jesus would maybe turning over the money changers to uh, rat. So this is where all this is. Now this courtyard, on any given day, especially during the Holy Saints, there could be as many as 10,000 priests making sacrifices daily. So that's how big this, this courtyard must have been. If you imagine how many little altars would take to put 10,000 priests in there on a day, plus whatever families, plus their doves or their pigeons or their rams or their lambs um, making sacrifices. Now, just imagine this scene for a moment. Let's just say there was a thousand of them. 
Um, how many of us ever been to a, a you know, Tyson, the, the, the slaughterhouse? What does that sound like? What does that smell like? Exactly. What does that smell like? What does it sound like? What does the this was not a clean cut purple or white marble wash kind of this was a dirty, smelly, rank kind of experience. Now what we're gonna see is is anesthetic. It's it's kinda of like a, a an operating room after a major open heart surgery with blood and guts and everything. It's ugly, and it's supposed to be. Now, when you walk in there, when it's after it's been cleaned up, oh, it's anesthetic, it's there. But after a, a <coughs> dirty surgery, it's it's dirty. That's what the temple would look like. Why? Because the, the forgiveness of sins is an ugly, dirty, smelly business. It's not clean and anesthetic. It's supposed to be ugly. The payment of sins isn't doesn't come clean and easy. And so the image when we get there, I want us to imagine that this isn't. Because we're just going to see it all kind of pretty and nice and clean and neat. But this was, ugh, and it smelled bad, and the bugs, and the noise, and the stench, and the volume of people offering the sacrifices. But it was all taking place around the outside of this, along these courtyards. And, and, and then on the inside, you got the money changers with all their little pens with the goats they're selling, or their pigeons, or their doves selling to the, the, the pilgrims who come in to buy and then they take it in and they make, oh, by the way, once they do the sacrifices, they take the blood, and what do they do with the blood? They put it in a bowl, and they put half of it on the altar, take the other half in the bowl, and they throw it out on the people. Because you want that blood to land on you, because there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. If the blood lands on you, then you've been received it. So this is, this is that ugly image that we want to have, and, and that's what was going on in this courtyard. That's what's happening here. Well, that's what we want to rebuild. Hopefully they're not going to do that to us there. No, but we had other things in mind. <laughs> so, so I, I just share this with you, but you know, we see this as such a beautiful, clean, neat, you know, reality. But you know, the the idea of of the sacrifice, and when we think of uh, how many remember that Mel Gibson movie, um, the the um, Passion of Christ, no, the Passion of Christ, Braveheart. Passion. Did you see the Passion of Christ? Yeah. Remember the crucifixion scene? That, that not the crucifixion. The, um, yeah. yeah, it was Mel yeah. Gibson did the passion and well, nothing. He, he directed it. Yeah. Oh, he directed it. Yeah. Um, the um, scourging scene. I just lost it. It was it was violent and it was gross and it was brutal. Yeah. The brutality was, and and I think that's probably pretty close to it. And because that's the kind of thing it took for our sins to be paid for. It wasn't just kind of simple and, and neat and clean and like, oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross. It probably didn't even hurt. We have to understand that that the price of the payment of my sins was, the, now the physical had nothing compared to the emotional and the physical or the mental, but the physical was, was still as awful as we can imagine. Um, and so what we see here is just a foretaste of what was going to happen to our Lord. So when we get over there and we look at this, we're going to see kind of the, the clean operating room, but you know, what, what really happened there was the dirty stuff. So I just kind of share that with you as, as the, the nature of it. We will get to see this model city, or at least it's on the design for the tour. Um, we're going to go to the to the western wall, or sometimes referred to as the Wailing Wall. It's a section of, of what's left of the, um, it's not the temple, but it would have been a temple platform um, that would have held up. What I didn't realize, which I was really excited to hear when I kind of look at it, is we're going to see some of the tunnels that they have just recently opened. And if you guys could see those. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some um, documentaries on some of those, and the, the tunnels are, are really fascinating. Now, I'm excited to see that. Um, the Western Wall, known as the Wailing Wall, or the Kotal, um, retaining wall of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, one of the holiest sites in all of Judaism, because that's what's left of the Second Temple. If you're a believing Jew, you, know, you haven't had a place to go. You haven't had that center to worship at for 2,000 years. And that's all you have left is this little section left. You can't even go physically where it used to be because you're not allowed to because it's owned by the Muslims since the Crusades, since the 1500s. So you're not even allowed to go there. This is as close as you can get to where God used to live, his former address. Um, anybody been to uh, Graceland? Why is it so popular? I mean, the guy's dead. He's been dead for 40, 50 years, and millions of people still go to a dead man's former home. 
and he wasn't even a god. He was the king of rock and roll. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was yeah. Elvis. He was. Imagine that you're. This is where God used to live. And all we have left of him is this wall. So that's, I mean, we still go to rehearse then because I liked his music and I remember. But it's nothing compared to where God used to be. And so the attraction is... is what I really remember is just the joy that was happening around this particular site. Yeah. Just all kinds of celebrations and all kinds of, very crowded, but all kinds of celebrations and joy happening around that site that day. Yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get there. There's also um, often a lot of protests because there's conflict between the Palestinians and Jews. So we don't know what you're going to show up. Um, one of the things to be aware of, um, it, this section is still controlled by the ultra-conservative Jews. And there is one section that I understand, and I'm just going by what I read, that has been allowed to be um, male and female, but a lot of it is still separated by gender. So there's one section by, is it the Wilson Gate? that you can, men and women can go to together, but for most part, it's separated by men and women. Uh, so you may get separated if you want to get too close. You may say, okay, women aren't allowed in this section because that's still their, their way to do it. And men, you have to wear a yarmulke. You have to wear proper clothing. So you go there. You can't go there, um, you know, dressed like a, you know, 22-year-old American. Um, so if male or female. Uh, so you have to dress probably, you know, cover your legs and your shoulders and, Things like that. When we went to the Vatican at Vatican City, mm -hmm. um, they, we had what, three different stations we go through where they checked and see that you were dressed properly before they let you in. Um, so it's the same thing. So be prepared to, to be. Shoulders and knees. Usually. Shoulders and knees for the females, and, and men, I think, you had to wear long pants. Um, so just kind of prepare yourself. No shirt, they, but just long pants. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't give our short sleeves, but um, uh, we had to use no shorts. Um, so kind of prepare yourself on that day that that there may be those requirements, and you have to wear a yarmulke, I believe, or at least some sort of head covering. Um, it's their site, and we respect and honor their their traditions, and, and we want to um, pay due honor to that. Uh, so that's the, the Wailing Wall, um, believed to be the last remaining structure of the Second Temple. Uh, it was destroyed in 70 AD. Um, Jewish pilgrimage uh, for centuries considered this a place of refuge of prayer uh, for Jews all over the world. Um, divided into separate sections, men and women, um, there are still pieces of paper that you can write on where people are trying to slip the prayers in between the cracks on a wall. Uh, you've probably seen that. Um, and I don't know if you want to write your own prayers and stick them in there, that's fine. Um, just from a biblical Christian perspective, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if it makes you feel good, fine. I'm not going to stop you. And if you say, I left your prayers at the wailing wall, all for God's going to hear it no matter what. But if you want to do that, I am probably, just don't, I don't want you to come away thinking, God really hurt me out because I left it well. No, it didn't matter. Um, if you want to leave them with me, I'll make sure that they get hurt. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter because I have no hotline either. Um, what I'm excited about is the, the wall tunnel. And I've never been, but I've heard about these. These are two tunnels that were just discovered or reopened in you know, only the last couple of years to uh, visitors. And you can't go through. They're not generally open to the public. You have to go through with a tour. Um, the tunnels that come down beside the wall and underneath where the rabbis used to do service the, the temple and the tunnels uh, when they were there. And so you can come down below and see the architecture the, um, or the archaeology that goes down all the way to the base, almost to the floor. So you, you come down below the courtyard and so you go through some of those. And, I, and so uh, the tour says we're going to go to the tunnels, so I'm expecting that. Um, at, did you guys go to the tunnels? Well, I thought we did, but if they're just open the last two years, then I'm lost. The last couple of years, I don't know. I mean, since 2016, I think is what yeah, it was. Yeah, I'm sure we did. Um, is when they first started allowing it, but they were discovered in like 69. Uh, um, these tunnels, they started digging them out, and there's just um, miles and miles and miles of these tunnels that the rabbis used 2,000 years ago to move around the temple, um, and they now are open. So. We'll get a lot more information, so don't trust what I'm telling you. I'm just reading it out of a book. <laughs> um, first open in 96, the public uh, destination is unique. Um, let's see, Rabbi's Tunnel is known. Um, Patriarch's Network Underground Tunnels, and uh, will even be part of the Second Temple, so all that. So just, um, I'm really excited about you know seeing the Wailing Wall, but just as excited about seeing the tunnels and see the original rock uh, that was used. Uh, Shrine of the Book. This is where the where the original temple, the second temple, now sits. Is now what you see. The Shrine of the Book um, uh, is now a Jewish or a uh, Muslim mosque. No, I'm sorry. This is not. That's the 
Shrine, Shrine of the Rock. Dome yeah. of the Rock. The Shrine of the Book. I'm sure. Um, this is one that. See, this is the place where they keep the Dead Sea Scrolls, or a portion of them. Um, collection of, of texts that date back to the Second Temple period. Um, Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in a, a area around Qumran. Um, and I think we're actually going to stop at Qumran in one of our, our visits. Um, in 1946-47, um, maybe you've heard, if you've everyone heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Um, you know the story of how they got discovered? Um, literally, there was a shepherd uh, who was tending his sheep, and there were a bunch of caves up on the side of the wall. Um, and one of the shepherd boys was trying to see if there were sheep that got in one of these caves. And he'd throw a rock in there, and the sheep would make noise, and he'd go in there and he'd chase them all. Well, he threw a rock in one of the caves, and he heard pottery break. So he went in and found the pottery, and there were some old papers and, and scrolls in there. Um, and so his dad grabbed them and thought, you know, these might be worth something, took them in. And in the course of about two years, they kind of bartered because they were just kept, you know, from the marketplace. They finally discovered that these were actual biblical documents going back to um, anywhere from 200 BC. These are the oldest known biblical documents that we have ever discovered. And they were found by a shepherd boy throwing a rock in a cave looking for sheep. And they were discovered in 1946-47, if I remember exactly that time frame. Um, what happened when we discovered them, I mean, obviously they had been decayed and they needed to be rediscovered, they needed to be interpreted. Um, we were, the theologians at that time, this was during the time when they were fighting for whether the Bible really was trustworthy because we didn't know if we had the accurate interpretation and we had all these different things. And there was lots of fear that if we found these out and that they were very different from the Bible we have today, what would they do to Christianity? So um, the owners of the Dead Sea Scrolls put together a select group of 50 or 80 secret, secret super, super secret scholars who would study these. And they didn't tell anyone what they discovered for years and years and years, decades. Um, and it wasn't until kind of electronic communication that came out that you started getting bits and pieces of the scrolls that would kind of leak out with interpretation. Um, and I mean, it went like for three decades. No one knew what was on them because they were afraid that they would find out that the scrolls written at the time of, of Jesus or before would be very different than what we have today. And the end result was they're almost identical. So that we have like the entire book of Isaiah from before the time of Jesus, and it's exactly what we have today. There's been very little, um, and there's a bunch and bunch of different uh, um, interpretations. But what we have here is, is we all see actually books, or hopefully see pages from the book of Isaiah uh, written you know, 300 years before the time of Jesus. Um, this is pretty amazing. Uh, so the discovery of the, the uh, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran. Um, Qumran is also one of the, the territories that it's suspected, no one really knows, that this is maybe where John the Baptist grew up. Um, because of the way he dressed and the way he lived, the suspicion that after you know he was a young adult that maybe Mary and Elizabeth, or Elizabeth and Zechariah sent him to the Qumran community, community they were kind of a hermit community that were very strict and rigid in their upbringing. Um, and they were known for, for ceremonial baptisms, ceremonial washing, ceremonial cleansing. Um, and they were the ones that had kept the Dead Sea Scrolls. So he may have been a part of this community uh, before he came into his public ministry to welcome Jesus. So um, John the Baptist may have been a part of this Qumran community. Um, I don't know how popular it is anymore, but that's at least what it was when we were going through sin. So we will get to see the, the shrine of the book. Um, there's uh, the, the outside picture. I think there's a picture in the book that you get. Um, the the structure, yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, it's a very interesting structure. It uh, kind of looks like a, a, a beehive or something that's uh, cone-shaped. Hershey's Kiss. Hershey's, Hershey's Kiss, Kiss. Yeah. yeah. Hershey's yeah. Kiss. Um, very interesting. It's supposed to represent pottery. and yeah. um, So yeah. it's interesting when you see it um, and inside. It's, uh, it's this so. Um, I'm looking forward to that, seeing, seeing this ancient uh, piece of text. Temple Mount, this is what I thought was before. Um, uh, the temple is uh, what we now know as the, the mosque of uh, um, Haram al-Sharif. Al -Sharif, uh, most important site of the Jews, Muslims, and Christians located in the Old City. Um, if you look at the map, I think... If you look on the front page of the one here, it's this section right here. It's kind of got a lot of the white in it um, on the front page. Um, 
and I think that's that's the Temple Mount in in the old city. The the four different colors are the four different uh, quarters of of the old city Jerusalem. Uh, there's the Jewish, the Muslim, the the Armenian, and the Christian quarter. Um, and so that's the Temple Mount is that squared off section. Does that make can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at here or describing here. Um, Locate the old city. Um, uh, let's see. Was the site of the two Jewish uh, temples. The first temple of Solomon's temple, built after the time of David, about 1000 BC. Um, you had King Saul, King David, and then King <coughs> Solomon. Solomon was the one that built the temple. Um, that lasted until 586 when it was destroyed. And then the second temple was built about 50, 60 years later. Um, Long, rich history dating back to Solomon. Um, after the destruction of the se Second Temple in 70, um, Common Era CE or 70 AD, uh, the Temple Mount was transformed into a platform for Roman military barracks. So um, it was used by the Roman military after the destruction um, because it's this wide open platform, made perfect for that. In 638, uh, the Temple Mount was captured by the Arab army, um, was transformed into a mosque. So this area where house the household of God um, it, this you, the continuation you can remember where this whole thing started um, go back to Mount Sinai where the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night when when God told the people to leave Mount Sinai and to wander in the desert uh, he had them build the tabernacle and they would know that God was present by his pillar of cloud and, and his presence um, and he stayed with them all those 40 years in the desert he stayed with them as they conquered the the promised land. He stayed with them in the in the tabernacle all the years during the conquest through the time of King Saul, through the time of the team of David as a tabernacle. And it wasn't until God asked, or David asked God if he could build the temple. He said, no, not you because of your blood, but Solomon will build it, that he had a permanent home. And God's presence was known there by his smoke in the presence. So this was literally the household of God that had been in his presence. This is where he chose to to build his, his permanent home. Now it's gone. It's been destroyed. God doesn't have a permanent home on earth, if you will. Um, and, it, and 600 years later, the place where the one true God has now been replaced with this false God, this, this mosque. And so if you're a Jew or if you're a Christian and you think of this, this is, I don't know about you, but this bothers me. <laughs> um, that, that somebody who doesn't worship the true God now is in that place where God wants it. But maybe it doesn't. Why doesn't it bother us? Because it doesn't matter. What? Because that, that he is, but people why? Are stupid. Huh? <laughs> people are stupid. People are stupid, but there's, there's, there's even a more powerful answer than that. Those are good answers. Because what happened that, that made the temple irrelevant? What happened that allowed the temple curtain to be torn in two that made the temple? <laughs> Bingo. Yeah. The temple is in, the, in Christ, isn't it? When he came, he was the final sacrifice. That God is present with us in body and blood. God is present in his word and sacrament. God is present with us through Christ. We don't need a building anymore. And, and your answers are right. <laughs> but it's more specific that I don't care if you build a mosque there. Because that's not where my God is. My God is where my word is. My God is where you know his sacraments are present. Where word and sacrament ministry are. So, yeah, it would be nice if there was a church there, but so what? Just kind of my own personal theology in that. Um, let's see. Um, so built there in 638, during the Crusades, the Temple Mount was really important. This was this is one of the main reasons why the Crusades took place. You know, after um, you know, the, the rise of Islam from 600 to about 1,000, uh, 10, 10, 12, 10, 15 um, A.D., the Christian nations weren't strong enough to, to take on the, the Islamic or the Muslim nations. But by about 12 or 1050 AD, the Christian nations were strong enough that they could go on and they, their desire was to retake the Temple Mount, to drive the, this mosque off this place where God once lived. And that was the whole essence of the Crusades. And so I think there were really three or four Crusades, depends on how you count them. <coughs> the Christians drove them off, and they, they owned it, and then the Muslims would take back, and the Christians drive them off. And this went on for about 200 years, where we're driving off. During this time was where you had the, the Knights Templar, 
you know, the, all the, that kind of stuff. And the, you know, all of that era was was they were trying to go down there to get rid of the Muslims off the Holy Land, off Jerusalem, and to, to get rid of this to this Temple. It was all fought on this area. Um, by the way, the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, doesn't that name sound familiar, Mount Moriah? <laughs> yeah. so, they call him in Moriah. That's not quite, I mean, that's, that's, right, that's not quite, Mount Moriah was another famous place. Somebody was called to go to Mount Moriah and make a sacrifice. Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac. Or Ishmael, depending on which tradition you follow. <laughs> so when you get to the Temple Mount, you will see there underneath it, and hopefully we can get in there, is what everyone believes, or at least they believe, is the actual rock where Abraham laid on Isaac and then sacrificed his own son, which is really sad because you can still see some bloodstains. Um, you all right? Why is that, why is that funny? <laughs> he, he, there's no bloodstains. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for getting that. It's like, really? No. I just wondering how far I could push this before somebody would call my bluff. All right. They'd be the goats. Yeah. They'd be the goats. They'd be the goats. Yeah. yeah. It was not his son. Thank you. But that was pretty good. I mean, you slipped that right in there. He's going to you guys right. are like, what kind of guy you mean? I'm taking so long. Man, this is going to be in the back of the bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he may have a microphone, but he's going yeah. to the back of the bus. <laughs> and Amy's on the front. She can unplug it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, the Crusades were a big part of this whole idea of fighting over who owns that Temple Mount. Obviously, they want it because they still have it. And it's been there since then. Um, Plight of it's still today is the, the center of political fight, as we mentioned last week. Um, one of the biggest problems that Israel and, and Palestine is having today, um, or the two-state solution, why we can't have two separate nations, Israel, and, is who gets to own Jerusalem. And that's the fight. And it's not just Jerusalem. It's specifically this part of Jerusalem. Um, and that fight has been going on Going all the way back to Abraham, did he did he attempt to sacrifice Isaac or Ishmael? Um, and I don't think we'll ever have that reality. It's managed by the Islamic, um, I don't even know how to say it, Waf. Um, it's open to the public. Uh, Jews are not allowed to pray there. They're not allowed to go in, but um, visitors are. So hopefully we'll be able to go in and see it. Um, I'm looking for the opportunity. That'd be fun. Uh, so, you know, just the Temple Mount. That'll be an interesting part in, uh, uh, of our trip. Um, one of the holy sites of Judaism, um, especially with the first temple, built where Isaac uh, was sacrificed or attempted to be. According to King David, uh, purchased the threshing floor uh, from the Jebusites, built an altar there. Solomon's son uh, built the first temple there, was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. We've talked about that. Um, temple, uh, second temple was built 500 years, um, was destroyed by the Romans in 70. Um, Associated with the figure of Melchizedek, you know, uh, New Testament, the temple was mentioned in connection with the events in the Passion of Jesus, um, the revolt of Rome. Um, we will see uh, Masada, um, I think on, on one of our days that we're going to go to Masada. Um, this was that during the intertestamental period. The temple was really important to that because um, the Jewish rebellion between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's 400 years of silence. About 155 to 1, I guess it would be 165 to 150 A.D. Um, the Bible doesn't have anything, but these are what we call the apocryphal books. Uh, books of Tobit, um, books of Judith, um, books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th Esdras. Um, those, those books that are in the Catholic Bible, but our Lutherans read. Um, there's some wonderful history in those books, but what happened during that time frame? There was a Jewish rebellion where they actually retook Israel and Jerusalem and reestablished worship in the temple. Um, that's the last time the Jews actually owned or had say over what happened in Jerusalem, uh, self-rule, um, government rule. And they didn't have it when they, were, um, when they lost control in 586 to the Assyrians, that's the, uh, except for this one little period of, of about 15 or 20 years. Jews never really had self-governing rule, and they haven't since then until 
1946 when when they reestablished the nation. So um, it's it's an important part of their history. So all right, I think that's probably enough for today. That kind of gets us to our time frame. Any um, questions, comments, thoughts? Is it can just give you a little bit of background information? No. Uh, yes. Yeah. Not that. So when you brought up that they dug up artifacts, I had it up when we was in Germany. We went to one of them museums over there of the stuff that they had brought back and dug up in the wall. What wall was that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they had that dug up that would have been buried for centuries and had it. That stuff looks brand new. I mean, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, it is. We um. We stopped at, well, we, we were at Hadrian's Wall when we were there in, in, um, in uh, England, and, and it was built in, in what, thousand? It's 2,000 years old, Hadrian's Wall. And, and it just looks like you know, it was put up you know, 10 years ago. It's amazing. So um, that's one of the, the hard things is to fathom. We, our sense of history, when we went to the Beehive um, Temple in Greece, it's 3,500 years old. Um, yeah. Have you guys at the Beehive Temple? I've, I've been to the Czech Republic, and yeah. you think of how old those buildings are, yeah. and cathedrals and everything are. Was this even in Germany or, or yeah. any right. of those countries? countries we, we have no countries. sense of history, we have um, no, and no. it's going to be so we amazing our, to think of stuff. Our schools that are 100 years old are old and dilapidated, yeah. and they tear them down. Yeah. It's like not even 100 years old. Well, and the fact they built this first temple... Two thousand or thousand years before Jesus was born, and they built that. We can't build something like that today. Um, Today's architects marvel at what they did. I mean, they can't hardly duplicate it today. So um, that's kind of what we have for today. We'll pick it up again next week. We're just going to keep our discussion. If you have um, I travel tips, ideas, uh, questions, comments. Filter them through uh, Barb or myself. Barb's probably the main point of communication. I kind of filter most of my stuff through her, and then she sends out. Um, what we do want to do is maybe that last week, uh, rather than doing Bible study, is just have kind of a general um, meeting of packing and security stuff. Um, so whatever that date is, maybe we want to pick that up for next week and just kind of put that on the calendar for a general travel tips and um, information meeting. Um, hopefully this has been helpful and get you kind of get you excited about it. Um, we got our uh, air or Apple tags um, yes this week, so I'm excited about those. Um, let's suppose we were to prayer. We'll call it a day, and you guys go watch your Super Bowl. The real important stuff. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, we we are all just overwhelmed and, and humbled at the opportunity and the privilege we have to to make this trip. We give you thanks for opening these doors and making it possible. We pray that you would fill our hearts with um, humility and, and uh, awe uh, as we prepare for this. Uh, allow us to truly uh, experience this, not just as a vacation, but as a spiritual time where we begin to understand you and how you became a part of our lives uh, in a more deep way, not just for ourselves, but that we can then share that with those that we come in contact with. Uh, be with us in the days and the weeks ahead, uh, that we may glorify your name in what we say and do, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Really? But what the point I have was all these drones all the time yeah. and I talked about it and it, there's a lot of rules. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 there's a lot of occasionally groves of I don't know, owls or whatever they are. Let's yeah. give you a lot of like broken down stuff. Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff. I, I have to kind of put my mindset like when we go to you know the temple or we go to some place that I have to get out of the commercial because there's still a lot of commercials and selling and and you know if we're seeing the Bethlehem you're not actually going to see the manger you're going to see you know, somebody's vision you prepare for going to the manger you want to watch it over you prepare you just know where it's at my granddaughter has a watch about oh yeah
where the wash out that has the track. Now the one thing to keep in mind is, by the way, on your calendar, I think what date is there is like no open day in Jerusalem where you just have a day to yourself. So um, I'm not sure what day that is, but they have major on the 20, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, don't let that day go by and say, oh, well, we didn't plan well. Yeah, right. So kind of plan out. How many people are not staying for Jordan? Just, just, the, three, just the three from Ohio. Oh, no. So she's not going. She's back down the trip. So all of us will be staying for the Jordan trip. So the only ones, the ones in Ohio, the only ones aren't going to Jordan. So that open day is just kind of start thinking in your mind the things that you want to see um, and places you want to go that maybe we're not going to get to. So how many people are getting these tracking things? I've got some for us, and we're going to think about it. No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, we, I'm getting four. I got mine through Apple, but they didn't get through Amazon. They're just the app air tag. Do they have the iPad? I'm sure they do. I will stop it. This is what we are down, and we just have to be out of here. Oh, yeah. I'm giving them their work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys can use it. If you bring us for something, I've got four. And we only need two. And we can give you two, and, and then we'll just program your phones, and when we get done, we'll do three programs from ours. You, I mean, if you don't, if you want your own, you're fine, but you don't need to. Because all we do is put them in our big suitcase. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's up to you. But it, 